before we can talk about pointers, we have to talk about two other things. The first thing is we have to do some patronizing review of what variables are. So I want to be able to ask questions like, what is the value of x? And we probably know the answer to that because we were around in week one of this class. What is the value of x? Well, it's, it's six, Bill, what is it? You're, no, what I'm asking is when I refer to a variable on my diagram and I say, what's the value? How do you get it? Well, it's just, it's six. The value of a variable on the diagram is what's in the box. If I ask you what's the value of x, it's what's in the box called x. If I ask you what the value of y is, it's what's in that box. It is nothing else. And I know that's patronizing. It seems weird that we would need to review that, but it's about to become really important. The value of a variable is what is in the box. Okay, that's one thing. The second thing that we have to talk about before we can talk about pointers is what is a pointer? And I've mentioned that pointers are really confusing to people, and there are sort of two reasons. And one of them is the notation. The notation is nasty. It's because we have to use all these symbols, and clearly the language designers were sort of running out of symbols to use by the time they got around to pointers. That's one thing. But it turns out that the concept of pointers, I don't think it's that tough. And I think that if you think about them the right way, they're actually a pretty beautiful feature. You can solve a lot of problems in a very elegant way if you use pointers correctly. But pointers look nasty when you start working with them, and if you don't know how to represent them and how to think about them, they can be a real nightmare to deal with. So what is a pointer? Ultimately, a pointer is directions for where to find something. That's it. And if you think about it, directions for where to find something can mean a lot of different things in different contexts. I can tell you where to find a building by giving you the street address. Uh, if we were at the UVic campus, I could tell you where to find my office by giving you this representation. I could say ECS 255, because on the UVic campus, we typically use a combination of the name of the building and the number of the room. And that would be a form of pointer, directions for where to find something. That's all a pointer is. It's a way of storing where to find some piece of data. And the reason that we like having that ability is that maybe there are times where we don't want to make a copy of our data when we throw it around the program. Instead, I want to give you directions for where you can go to find it. If I forget a book in my office and I don't have time to go rifling through my stuff, here are my options. I could go back to my office, but I, I can't go back to my office. I haven't been to my office in weeks, but also um, I don't have time right now. Okay, I could make you a photocopy of every single thing in my office, and then you could rifle through it. Okay, but that's absurd. Why would I do that? Of course, making the photocopy would take longer than finding the thing. Or what I could do is I could hand you the keys. I could give you a pointer to tell you where my office is, and I could have you go looking for the items. Now, if I do that, obviously I have to trust you, because if I give you access to my original stuff, my private belongings, there's a chance you could go in there and, you know, set fire to the place. Or you could go in there and you could change everybody's midterm mark or something like that. Now, I've mentioned this to people in the past, but if you're ever in that situation, don't change everybody's midterm mark. It'll make it way too obvious. Just change your own and change a couple of other people's or something. Just, you know, keep it to four or five to, to reduce suspicion. Um, but the idea behind using pointers is that there are times when directions to something are a lot more compact and usually we can trust whoever we're giving them to. And so all a pointer is, is a way of representing directions for where to find something. Now that's one thing. There is a question though. I know how to give directions in real life. I can tell you where to find a building. I can say, go down the street and turn left, whatever. But what do I do in a computer? It's true, it turns out, that inside of a computer, there is a way of referring to the memory location where every, every individual piece of data is stored. Every piece of data in a computer has an address. But just like how we don't care that the letter uppercase A is number 65 in our character set, we also don't care that much what the particular address of a variable is. All we care about is, if I need directions, I can always get them. And so what I want to do in this program here is create a new variable, a variable of some strange type. And just to reinforce that review from earlier, if I ever ask you, what is the value of a variable? Here's a variable t. And I've stored inside the variable t this triangle. 
And I'm not kidding. What's the value of the variable t? Well, let's take a look and see what's in the box. Oh yeah, it's this triangle. I guess that's the value of the variable. Fair enough. That's actually what I want to do. I want to trust the diagram that much. What I want to do is I want to create a variable p. And I want it to have a special type. Pointer to int. I want the whole purpose of p in the world to be to contain directions for where I can find an int. Now, of course, it's true that I could write the real address of my int in my diagram, but I don't even know what that is, and I don't care. What I care is that p contains directions for where I can find one of my other variables. For example, p could contain this arrow that points at x. And when I refer to pointer values in this course, I'm always going to use these arrows because that is the intuitive way to interpret them. We know that x is an int and it contains the value 6. We also know that internally, inside the computer, it's not stored as a decimal value. It's stored in binary, whatever that means. We don't care. The point of our diagram is for, something, is for us to be able to read it, not for the computer. So I want to make a variable called p, which can contain directions to an int. It can contain values that are pointers to an int. Before we go any further, because obviously we have to talk about what exactly is the real type of p, before we go any further, what is the value of p? p is a variable. It's a strange one, but it's a variable. What's its value? Well, there's the age-old custom. Look inside the box. What is in the box called p? Um, this arrow. The contents of p, the value inside of p, is an arrow pointing at x. That's it. Um, one of the biggest problems people have with pointers is the misconception. When I ask, what's the value of p? They say 6. But I go looking in the box called p. I don't see the number 6. I see an arrow. And it's important. The box called p contains an arrow pointing at x. A pointer doesn't contain a number at all. It contains directions to something else. Maybe right now it contains an arrow that points at x. But in a minute, I could if I wanted to, and we'll see in the next couple of videos, I could change it. So p contains instead an arrow pointing at y. p is a box that contains an arrow pointing at an int. It's also significant that because types are so important in C, um, if I want to point to something, it's significant what type of thing I'm pointing at. If I had a, another variable over here called f, um, so we'll give it a value, if f is a float, I have this variable that's supposed to be a pointer to an int. This variable can't point at f. It can only point at an int. And that means I'd have to make a second variable if I wanted to, for some reason, get directions to my float. That's significant. And we'll see in a minute that that's important because it affects what the real type of my variable p is. If I ask what's the type of p, the answer can't just be pointer because we need to know what kind of thing it points to. The type of p will be pointer to int. So our next question is, how do I create a variable that can store directions to other variables? Well, I can't have the type pointer to int. Instead, in C, we use a very strange cryptic notation. And we write the notation, or I like to read the notation at least, from right to left. So when I want to make a pointer to int, every time I say the words pointer to, I write a star. And I work from right to left. Pointer to int. Pointer to int int star. And so I'm going to create a variable over here of type int star. I'm going to call it p. int star p. And whenever you see a type with a star in it, you read that type from right to left. Every time you see a star, you read that as pointer to. So what's the type of p? p is a pointer to an int. All right. The next thing I want to do is I want to put something in that box. I would like to set uh, the value of p to be an arrow pointing at x. So p equals, I'm doing an assignment statement. And one of those things that we can trust, even now, even with pointers, is the only time you can ever modify a variable is when that variable appears on the left-hand side of an assignment statement. Now, in a couple of minutes, we'll notice that soon there might be multiple ways to refer to a particular variable. But ultimately, the only way to change a variable is with an assignment statement. So p equals, the effect that I want is to have p contain an arrow pointing at x. Here is how we create arrows pointing at variables in C. We use this strange looking operator, ampersand x. And I read this, whenever I read ampersand x, I read that to mean arrow pointing at x. If you stick an ampersand, a single ampersand, in front of any variable, you are making an arrow pointing at that variable. So as of this point in my code, p contains 
an arrow pointing at X. And I have to keep my diagram up to date. And if there ever were a time to um, uh, expound on the benefits of diagrams, this is it. All that stuff I said earlier about scope and types and whatever, well, that's still important, I guess. But seriously, uh, if you weren't a convert to diagrams before, trust me, having a diagram for pointers is a lifesaver. Um, I'm going to be able to, maybe one day I can draw good looking arrowheads too. Okay, so there's an arrow. P contains an arrow pointing at X. Now, uh, before I go further, uh, we want to get to task two sometime today, I want to talk about how we can use the pointer. So the value of P itself is just this arrow. If I ask you, what's, in the, what's the value of P? What's in the box called P? Uh, an arrow pointing at X. Okay, what does that even mean? Really, the purpose of a pointer is to use that arrow for something. So what I want is the ability to, if I'm looking at an arrow that points at X, follow that arrow and see what's at the other end. And of course, I know from my diagram that right now P contains an arrow pointing at X. But maybe later it points somewhere else. At any given time, I might want to say, look in the box called P, follow the arrow that you find, and tell me where you end up. So let's try this. So P is a pointer to an int. And if I follow the arrow and see what it points at, that means I should find myself at an int. In general, if you're at a type like int star and you follow an arrow, the type you end up at is whatever came before the star. So you just knock off a star from the type. Okay, so how do I do that? How do I follow an arrow starting at the value of a variable? This also, I like to read this from right to left. So what you do is you write the name P and then to the left of it, uh, you put a star every time you want to follow an arrow. So I would write star P. And I read this as start at P, follow one arrow. So I work my way from right to left. You read the variable's name, and then you work your way to the left. Every time you see a star, and yes, there could be more than one of them, every time you see a star, you read that to say follow one arrow. So star P, F start at P, follow one arrow. And we'll see where we end up. So I'll try compiling and running this. Uh, whoops, pointer two or one. Okay, x is six, y is 10. That's this print statement on line 17. And then down on line 25, following an arrow from p, I get the value six. I start at p, I follow an arrow, and I get the value six. And just to be clear, let's try setting p to instead contain an arrow that points at y. So we'll just erase that, and now P contains this arrow that points at Y. And we'll try running that to verify that if I start at P and I follow that arrow, I should get the value 10. And let me scroll down. Sure enough, there is the value 10. So I start at P, I follow an arrow. And the key thing here is that P itself does not contain the number 10. It's obvious. We have to trust our diagram. All that P contains is an arrow. If I need the number 10, I have to follow that arrow. Okay, so we'll go back. We'll set P again to contain um, the value uh, arrow pointing at X. And I will update my diagram accordingly. There we go. Uh, whoops. And then there it is, arrow pointing at X. Uh, and then I will uh, uncomment this print statement I prepared just for this task. So we'll print out the value of x, the value of y, and the value of star p. Now you might want to experiment with what happens if you try and print out just p. What happens if you try and print out the value of that arrow? It ends up being some strange number because really inside the computer, this arrow, directions for where to find something, is just a number. We're using an arrow as a, as, as a device for the sake of understanding it. But of course, the actual address of a variable is some number in the computer's memory. But we don't care what number it is. We only care that if I make an arrow pointing at something, I can follow that arrow to get to the thing I'm pointing to. So we'll run this to make sure everything still works. And then the question's going to become, okay, great, we have an arrow that points at something. I can write star p, start at p, follow an arrow, to follow that arrow and see where I end up. What else can I do with that? And the key thing here is that whenever you use star p, so star p is start at p, follow an arrow, and I end up at this box. I am now able to use, in this context, star p exactly the same way I would use the name x. Star p is another way of referring to this box. Anywhere I could use the name x to refer to this box, I could use star p instead. So let's take a look at task number two. Let's remove some of this obnoxious white space. Um, so I want to use P, the pointer that I just created, to modify the value of X to be 100. So what I want is to write this, but I'm not allowed to use X. I have to use P. 
to do that. So first off, let's take a look at what would happen if I cheat and I use the value x that I'm not supposed to use. Okay, so in task two, x is 100, y is 10, and star p is 100 because star p is just back to x. And in fact, I should uh, erase this and write 100 here. Okay, great. But I'm not allowed to use the name x for that, so what can I do? Well, what I want to do is find a way of using p instead. So if we go back to where we were a minute ago, x has the value 6. And what I want to do is I want to set x to be 100. I have to find some way of getting to that box without using the name x. And of course, we know we can do that. We start at p and we follow an arrow. So if I start at p and follow an arrow and pay special attention to the fact that that star goes on the left, very common mistake on midterm questions is putting the star on the wrong side. We will mark you down for that. So it's star p. We start at p, follow one arrow, wherever I end up, set it to the value 100. Take a look at that, and we do get the desired effect. Uh, and so what we have created here is a variable that can store directions. And we can use this special operator star, if I write star p, to we, we refer to this operator, the star operator here, as dereference. So p contains an arrow, which is a reference. It's a way of referring to another variable. Dereferencing is the process of taking that arrow and following it to get to where it it points. And, and so the star operator is called the dereference operator. Now, I, I don't usually use that term. I instead just say star p. Um, the idea behind this is that now we have variables that can store directions to other variables, and I can choose to follow them. I could even pass that variable to a function. I could hand the function a pointer to my variable x. That would give the function the ability to modify my private possessions if I give it that access. Uh, and so the next few videos will mostly just be talking about all the different ways we can throw around pointers and set pointers and create pointers to things. And a key thing to note here is that p is a bit weird, but it's just a regular variable. It is, no, it is really no different than x or y. It just has a very strange type. And it turns out that the type of p in star is just an ordinary type. It looks weird, but it's just an ordinary type. And so in the next few videos, we have to talk about all the interesting things we can do with pointers, but also the question of what kinds of things can we make pointers to. I can make a pointer to an int, int star. I can make a pointer to a float. What else can I make uh, my pointer variable point at?